Right, thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. It was um, it was very brave of you to uh, invite me to speak at your conference when uh, I could only speak in English. So I have a lot to say, but I've been asked to speak slowly and to say it all in 30 minutes. So I will do my best, and I hope that some of the pictures in my PowerPoint presentation will speak louder than my words. What I want to try and do in this half an hour is to briefly review the origins, the politics, and the future prospects of electronic monitoring, uh, to speak in a way that I hope practitioners will find interesting, but also to suggest that there's a lot more to be done among academics to theorise the subject of electronic monitoring more and better than we have done in the past in the context of the network society. There is a, a conceptual relationship between the information society and the network society, but that's too complicated to go into today. In England, which was the first European country to experiment with electronic monitoring, we call the ankle bracelet a tag, and the process is called tagging. And that language has caught on in uh, other countries, um, but it is by no means um, ubiquitous, and I don't think that it's a term that uh, you have used a lot in Spain. But probably everybody here knows what an electronic tag looks like, and has a broad understanding of how the basic form of electronic tagging, which is a means of enforcing a curfew on a person um, to live in their own home for 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, different countries is vary. But, but the basic principle is to il remotely, electronically monitor and enforce a form of house arrest. And of course house arrest is a very old penalty in some countries. It's not been used in uh, England, for example, before, but uh, the idea of confining a person to their own home as a punishment wasn't new. It just became more feasible as a criminal penalty when electronic monitoring became available. But of course, in the 21st century, electronic monitoring can no longer be thought of simply as one technological practice the use of electronic technology to enforce a curfew, to restrict a person to a certain place for a certain number of hours per day, for a certain number of weeks or months or even years. There is a, a voice verification technology, which is also used to identify the whereabouts of a particular person in a particular place, but it requires the, the recognition of our distinct voice print um, down a telephone rather than the wearing of an ankle tag. It's possible to remotely monitor the alcohol intake of certain people. Um, you have to, uh, you, you treat the monitoring device as a, as a breathalyzer and you are telephoned and you have to breathe in to the uh, uh, device and the computer at the other end of the, uh, of the telephone line can tell whether or not you've been drinking. And in some countries, when you're the subject of a community penalty, you can be banned from consuming alcohol. More famously, we have um, the satellite tracking of offenders using the, the GPS, the Global Positioning System of Satellites. Um, the, this, the Global Positioning System of Satellites is a, an American structure, but it is available for the rest of the world to use, and it enables the, the monitoring of movements wherever offenders go, and the designation of exclusion zones into which they're not permitted to go. And it's also possible now to speak of electronic monitoring as a means of monitoring the whereabouts of prisoners within an institution. It isn't even possible to say that electronic monitoring is, is now only something that you could use um, to manage offenders in the community. You can use it to manage offenders' movements within um, a prison establishment as well. And I suppose it's fair to say that um, a sixth type of electronic monitoring is when you use it for victim protection. And the victim is given an alarm, which she, usually she, carries with her, 
that tells her when the offender who is wearing the tag comes into proximity with her. Right? So electronic monitoring is no longer just about curfews. It is, it is a wide range of technologies, and different countries have got different attitudes towards these technologies. But the potential um, for using it is now quite wide. It can be used as a community sentence by itself or integrated with social work and probation. It can be a conditional prison sentence. It can be a form of pretrial detention or bail. It can be used to enforce a restraining order to keep a violent partner away from his victim. It can be used as a means of early release of short-term prisoners. It can be used, as you use it here in Catalonia, as a form of temporary release from prison. It can be used for the parole of longer-term prisoners. And it can be used with either adults or juveniles, although there is less use of juveniles in Europe. And it can be used by itself. In some countries, England and Wales, Scotland, believe it's a good thing to use by itself. Most other countries in Europe think it should be integrated with um, social work and rehabilitation programs. It's not a new idea, but my guess is a lot of people in this room will not know just how far back the, the concept of electronic monitoring actually goes. Um, the idea that we should be able to use technology to track a person's movements, that was actually envisaged and favoured before somebody thought that electronic monitoring would be a good way of enforcing house arrest. At the same time as this was being thought of for offenders, um, people were thinking about the, the medical uses of this technology monitoring the, the heartbeats and the breathing rates of old people and ill people. Some people even thought that it might be a good idea to send electric shocks out to offenders to stop them doing things, right? There was the idea that electronic monitoring could inflict pain on people. But the actual practice of electronic monitoring, the first people to develop something that resembles the electronic monitoring we have today, um, deeply believed that you could use it for rehabilitative purposes that it would be a form of control rather than a punishment and that you would use it in the context of support programs that were helping young offenders in particular to give up crime. And the quotation at the bottom of the page there, um, which suggests that electronic monitoring would be better than prison because it would enable offenders to stay with their families and keep their jobs and that it would actually provide a, an extra level of control in society, that sounds like a very contemporary way of talking about electronic monitoring, but in fact it was said originally in 1964. And the man who said it, Ralph Fitzgerald, who was a psychologist who worked at Harvard University, and he was really the person along with his brother, Robert, who pioneered this technology, um, he also believed passionately that if you used electronic monitoring properly as a rehabilitative device, alongside other rehabilitative measures, America would be able to do with much less prison. And there's the quote to, to that effect. And these, Ralph and Robert are still alive, or they were still alive in 2010. Uh, they changed their name from Schwitzgebel to Gable. And those of you who speak German will know why they did that. More famously, electronic monitoring is associated with a judge in New Mexico who was the first person to actually use modern forms of electronic monitoring on offenders. And there is a famous story that he was influenced by a Spider-Man comic, and this is true, but it, he was influenced by other things, and you can exaggerate the significance of the Spider-Man story, but, but it is, it's a true story. It's a true story. And of course in America, electronic monitoring is thought of as a punishment, and GPS tracking can actually be imposed on some offenders for the whole of their lives, some sex offenders, because we don't like sex offenders, and there's nothing we can't do to them to punish them. Nothing is, is bad enough. They haven't got the same civil rights as the rest of us, so we can tag them for life. And tough guys like Arnold Schwarzenegger um, have given a lot of publicity to that use of electronic monitoring. But, but it's easy to think of the United States of America as a place where electronic monitoring is very important because they started it and they've been doing it for a long time. But the real story about America is that it was very slow to start there, and it never grew very fast, and it never became as big and important as the commercial organizations who promoted it thought it was going to be. 
there was always a very utopian view about what electronic monitoring would be able to achieve, which is like a, the way in which science fiction pervades some aspects of American culture. And electronic monitoring played into that, I think, in, 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 a, in a big way. Um, lots of um, the developments in America were actually led by commercial organizations um, who, who pushed the idea onto practitioners without the practitioners really understanding what they were doing. And it was never researched very well, but it expanded regardless. But the trouble in America, I suppose, for the people who thought electronic monitoring was a good thing, and the companies who thought they would make a lot of money out of it, is that while it was being promoted as a punishment, it simply wasn't punishment enough. And there was never a really widespread use of it in the United States of America. The numbers are large relative to Europe. 100,000 people per day are under curfew in the United States of America. 40,000 people per day are subject to satellite tracking. Big numbers. But you have to remember there are 2 million people in prison and 5 million people under community supervision in America. And against that kind of figure, electronic monitoring doesn't look as though it's, it's huge. The story of electronic monitoring that I know best is, is my own country, England and Wales. England was the first country, as it often is, to pick up this American idea and pilot it in 1989 and 1996. We didn't create a national scheme until 1999, and, and by then Sweden already had a national scheme, which they started in 1996. Since then, we've tagged almost a million offenders, and on any given day in England, there are 19,000 people who are tagged. And we do use it a lot as a, as a standalone measure. We don't integrate it a lot with probation. Sometimes we do. For juveniles, we tend to, but for adults, we don't always bother. Um, most of the people are on a community sentence. The other half are on a, an early release from prison. That's the, the, the dominant form of it. Um, we use a private sector organisation to deliver it, and that's one of the ways in which it's been kept separate from probation and made it difficult to integrate with probation. Uh, we did pilot GPS in 2004, but we thought it was too expensive and we haven't resumed the idea of that. But, but simply giving you those brief facts about England and Wales, as with any country, would misses the point about the political controversy that has often surrounded electronic monitoring. Now, the, the politics of electronic monitoring seem to me, the more I learn about it in different countries, to be different in every, in every country. So if I tell you that in, uh, in England and Wales, the people who most wanted to promote electronic monitoring were in fact a right-wing government, but it was a right-wing government that wanted to reduce the use of imprisonment because prison was very expensive. But in order to reduce the use of imprisonment, they wanted community penalties to be much more about punishment and control than about rehabilitation. And they thought the electronic monitoring would definitely be a good thing to do to make community penalties more punitive. The Labour government who followed them into power in 1997, they were even more enthusiastic about electronic monitoring for the same reasons, but even when the Labour government decided to increase the prison population, they still maintained its, their support for electronic monitoring. And I think it's fair to say that in England, partly because England was the first country in Europe to, to pick up this American idea, that the politicians had very high expectations of it. They, they told the public and they told the media that electronic monitoring would transform the way we supervise offenders in the community. And of course, it wasn't good enough to do that. So expectations were raised and then people were a little disappointed by the reality of it. The results from research were good enough to keep doing it, but, but not really good enough to use it on a large scale. And the fact that we have used it on a large scale reflects more than research. There was a kind of an ideological commitment to this technology which transcended the results of, electronic, of, of the research. It was never properly integrated with probation, and it never has been, and paradoxically the right wing who once supported it have now turned against it as a lenient punishment. So this is the kind of newspaper image that you once had in England. The, the politicians were supporting electronic monitoring. Many of the controversies we had in England are actually reflected in the cartoons that were in newspapers. So in this cartoon, a, a very lazy man is tagged and living at home, and he's making his wife do all the work. Right? And far from young people being stigmatized or deterred by the thought of having an electronic tag, 
Um, some newspapers suggested that they might actually find it very prestigious and that their status would rise if they wore an electronic tag. And some people suggested that tagging was so stupid and foolish that it was like letting wild animals out of a zoo. And when we had unfortunate things did sometimes happen in the real world of electronic monitoring, we did once have uh, a man who had an electronic tag fitted to his artificial leg and when, he, when the monitoring officers had left his house, he, took his, he removed his artificial leg and he went down to the bar for a drink. And, and when that sort of story gets in the newspapers, it doesn't make electronic monitoring look as though it really is a very tough punishment. And then the, the right wing who had supported it, they decided it wasn't very good as a means of reducing crime. But nonetheless, it, it expanded in England as it expanded worldwide. And my estimate is that there are about 30 countries who use electronic monitoring worldwide, either as a national scheme or as a pilot. And the reasons that one might give, the reasons that different countries have given, some emphasising some things more than others, some emphasising particular combinations of these things, but they want to reduce the numbers of people in prison, and they want to use the costs of imprisonment. They want to make community penalties tougher and more controlling. They want to modernise their, their state. They want to modernise their criminal justice system. And one way of symbolically demonstrating your commitment to modernisation is to use modern technology. Um, there's also a sense of disillusion, I think, with probation in some countries, particularly in England and Wales, the belief that probation is a very 20th century idea and that in the 21st century we should be doing it differently. I think the surveillance culture that developed in the Western world after the 9-11 events helped to kind of create a climate where electronic monitoring seemed um, uh, more appropriate. And there was research, and the, while the research has never been great, and I'll say some more about that in a minute, it does suggest that while people are on electronic monitoring, while they're subject to it, if not afterwards, they do tend to comply with the requirements. Countries have learned from each other, and the big commercial organisations that develop this technology like to show off what they're doing in one country to another country. So, both politically and commercially, there have been mechanisms for, for transferring this technology around the world. But crucially, it, this technology would simply not be possible if it wasn't for the global electronic infrastructure that we all use to communicate with each other, the mobile phones, the satellite systems, Skype, whatever. Without an infrastructure, right, that Manuel Castells calls the network society, none of the possibilities for monitoring offenders and tracking offenders would have come into being. So that's, the, in a sense, the connection with the network society. Um, electronic monitoring is very much a consequence of our having become a network society. So the research that has been done into electronic monitoring is, is limited, but it's not negligible. It's not that we know nothing about electronic monitoring from research. But as Mark Renzimer, an American academic who has followed this from the beginning, has said, much better research could have been done in the United States and much more research could have been done. But there isn't really an evaluation culture. That there is a crime suppression effect that while you're wearing the tag, there is a less likelihood of you reoffending. Um, Thomas Blomberg's research in Florida, I think, has demonstrated that fairly conclusively, although it's far from a perfect piece of research. Several people have, have demonstrated that when you take the tag off, your behaviour hasn't changed, and why would it? Why would wearing a tag have changed your behaviour? So it doesn't affect long-term recidivism. Yes, in some instances, depending on how you use it, you can reduce the costs of in, the use and cost of imprisonment. But it doesn't always happen like that. And some countries don't care. They want to use it, but they're not actually looking to reduce the use of imprisonment. When you ask offenders about the experience of being monitored, most of them say that they find it difficult, stressful, tense, but they do prefer it to prison. There are some offenders who don't, and who prefer to be in prison. We do know that it sometimes increases stress in families, and we do know that the media have tended never to take electronic monitoring all that seriously, in America or England and Wales as um, an onerous punishment. But the issue about research, right, raises the questions, what have we been researching? Have we been researching the best possible uses of electronic monitoring? Have we asked the right questions of how we should use it? Have we even researched the right issues? And 
The answer is probably not. But if we take the three best pieces of research that have been done on electronic monitoring, and there are probably more than three, but just to pick these three out, the Swedish research by Holmberg did show that a combination of electronic monitoring work and social work support made a very significant impact on the reduction of recidivism. The Swiss research by Martin Killius, the recently published research, comparing electronic monitoring and community service, and that was a very methodologically sound piece of work, um, did make certain claims about how electronic monitoring might be used well. And the famous Canadian research by James Bonta did show, right, by uh, a very clear and explicit methodology, that, young, that offenders who were electronically monitored were more likely to complete a rehabilitation program than offenders who weren't electronically monitored. But that's just one piece of research about one program. But nonetheless, there's some good ideas there. We suggest that the, the best way to use electronic monitoring is to use it to augment social work and probation in the community supervision of offenders, not to use it by itself. To use it instead of prison, always to try to use it instead of prison, and including a form of early release from prison. Um, and using electronic monitoring to address patterns of criminal activity, to intervene in the spatial and temporal patterns that offenders get into when they're offending. Try and disrupt those patterns right, in offenders' lives that lead to the offending by structuring their lives with electronic monitoring. Now, that idea has been talked about a lot, but I'm still not sure that people in the probation office in the community, social workers in the community, know how to do that. And electronic monitoring should be publicised in the media because I think it helps to increase um, the both the perceived and actual effect of community safety. We should be straightforward about how we understand electronic monitoring as a technology. And it is a form of surveillance technology, right? It is a form of surveillance technology. It's not social work, it's not rehabilitation, it's not even punishment in, in its own terms. It is just surveillance. It is a way of doing rem remote location monitoring. Finding out where people are, identifying the locations, pinpointing them. It's not about looking at them or seeing them like CCTV. It's a way of pinpointing them. It monitors the body, the presence of the body here, the presence of the body there, or the absence of the body here, the absence of the body there. And it affects the mind in the sense that it makes the offender think, where should I be at this moment in time? When should I get home to abide by my curfew? Right? It enforces a very simple form of compliance. Because compliance with electronic monitoring is basically about being where you are supposed to be at a certain time or not being where you're supposed to be. If you are where you are supposed to be, you are complying. If you are not where you are supposed to be, you are in breach. Right? It's a very simple way of, of controlling people. It's not in any sense inherently rehabilitative because it doesn't require the internalization of norms of law abiding this. There's, no, there's nothing intrinsic about electronic monitoring which can change your attitudes or think in more law-abiding ways. But that doesn't mean that you can't combine this form of surveillance with rehabilitation. Now, the American companies, the largely American companies that promote this, what, what they actually emphasize about electronic monitoring is that it gives you control in real time in a way that social work was, was never able to do. Social work might be able to control retrospectively, but it could never actually exert any kind of control in real time. And some of these companies, their, their advertisements tell you how, how they see this. What they're really trying to do is, is to modify the very notion of control so that if control isn't in real time, it's not really control or it's not good control or it's not efficient control or the best possible form of control. And by projecting the image of electronic monitoring in that way, they're obviously trying to say that this is much better than social work or probation because they can't exert control in real time, right? And there's also a message that you get from the companies. If we can do this, if we have this technology, we should use this technology. So electronic monitoring isn't intrinsically rehabilitative, but you can add it to rehabilitation. And Bonta, James Bonta's research suggests that if you have electronic monitoring as well as rehabilitation programs, you are more likely to enable offenders to get the benefit of those rehabilitation programs. Um, the public confidence in community penalties may be increased if electronic monitoring is added to rehabilitation because the public tend to think that rehabilitation programs in the community don't have enough control and electronic monitoring is a useful way of, of rectifying that. Now an English researcher called Anthea Hucklesby 
has suggested that electronic monitoring by itself sometimes does make offenders think, where's my life going? Should I change my ways? Should I alter my friendship networks? But if there's no social worker there to capitalise on that, as there often isn't in England, um, that's only, only a good effect of electronic monitoring that has really been wasted. This issue of compliance, right? A lot of thought has been given as to how we get offenders to comply with, with it. And getting offenders to comply with their community supervision is very important to enabling them to get the benefit of the rehabilitative effects. And we know how to get offenders to comply. We, we give them incentives, we trust them, uh, we threaten them with something worse, and that's all a useful way of managing offenders in the community. What electronic monitoring adds into this is a form of surveillance-based compliance as well. And it, it's not better than threat-based or trust-based or incentive-based, it's just another way of helping to get <coughs> compliance. And I think we should, we should use it. And I'm not going to say anything more about that, because I want to move on a little bit, but it adds a new way of getting offenders to comply with a community sentence, and that's a good thing. <coughs> in terms of theorising electronic monitoring, right, if we move to kind of academic and theoretical issues, I think, well, because I am a criminologist by background and a social worker by background, I, I first started to think about electronic monitoring purely in terms of the criminological knowledge, the penological knowledge that I had. What, what's interesting about electronic monitoring as an alternative to custody why is it different from or better than probation or community service or day centres or whatever? And I, I quickly, well, slowly I found that that wasn't enough as, as, a, as a way of, of thinking about it. And I really needed to understand a lot more about the sociology of the information society, of the network society, the sociology of technological innovation to understand electronic monitoring properly. And we wouldn't be able to do any of this in the world were it not for the affordances, the opportunities that the global electronic communication technology has actually opened up. And this is a permanent change, I think, in the way we might manage offenders in the community, because it means that politicians will always have the option of thinking about using global electronic communication systems to manage offenders in the community. That there'll never be a time when the only people who can offer governments the expertise to manage offenders in the community will be social work, probation, or police. There, there's, a, there's a new knowledge base for understanding how we might do that, and how we combine that new expertise, this, this new system of managing offenders in the community by monitoring the locations, how we combine that with probation, social work, and policing remains, I think, one of the big challenges of the 21st century. And I've come to the conclusion, although it's different in different countries, that the, way, the different types of electronic monitoring, the way in which electronic monitoring develops, the degree to which it, is, it develops, the extremes to which it develops, reflects a combination of government attitudes both towards penality and offenders and attitudes towards modern technology. You have to factor in governmental attitudes towards modern technology to understand why electronic monitoring develops the way it does in particular countries. Now, empirically, these processes of techno-correctional innovation um, are little studied, especially cross-culturally, and there are lots of good PhDs to be done about this subject in the, in the coming future. Electronic monitoring, I think, can be seen as a form of telepresence. Now, telepresence is a word that you usually associate with video conferencing, because you can see somebody on the screen who, who is a long way. You can't actually see a person on the screen in front of you when you're doing electronic monitoring, but you can tell whether they're in their house or not. You can, if you're using GPS, tell whether they're going into their exclusion zone or not. So an American called William Mitchell created this phrase, economies of presence, right? How much money do you want to spend to have close physical, personal contact with an offender or, or a person or a businessman? And how much money do you want to spend on simulated contact through electronic communication networks? And I think that business understanding of economies of presence has now translated itself into the criminal justice world. And we have administrators who can make decisions about how much face-to-face -face time we need to spend with offenders and how much virtual time we need to spend monitoring them. The full potential of electronic monitoring may never be fully realised for cost reasons or for ethical reasons, right? 
Yeah, a lot of people have dreamed of very utopian scenarios or very dystopian scenarios about how wonderfully transformative or how devastatingly destructive electronic monitoring might be if we use it on a large scale, every possible technology used in the maximum possible way. But we haven't actually done that yet. And I suppose there is a question of how far will we go with it? Will we still be using this technology in 2050? How will we be using it? Right? How sophisticated will the technology have become? Maybe we will be using just the same technology we've got now. Maybe it won't advance much further than this. Right? How we decide that depends on political decisions, and it isn't easily predictable as to how far we will take this technology. The companies, the commercial organisations, want us to take it a long way. The historical record, I think, suggests that different penal cultures and different penal institutional networks in different countries do constrain and shape and dampen the development of this technology. They want to use it, right? But they don't want to use it to the maximum, right? That's where we're at, I think. Paul Virilio, he talks about speed machines speeding up the, our access to knowledge and information, and vision machines seeing things at a distance, and you can use those concepts, I think, to illuminate uh, electronic monitoring, and you wouldn't find it in criminology and penology. Um, and certainly Virilio is a person who believes the worst of modern technology. He thinks it will have a, a very dystopian effect upon us, but maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. We should read him and think about him in relation to electronic monitoring, but I don't actually share his dystopian, the extreme dystopian view that he takes it to. Nor do I really share the view of William Bogard that although electronic monitoring is a form of social control in, in a telematic society, it is a form of re remote location monitoring, but he paints a very dismal picture of the kind of society that is going to result from the excessive use of any kind of remote surveillance devices. And I think he takes it too far. But he might say to me, you know, we've got to wait further into the 21st century to see how far this goes. And things may turn bad, or they may not, and nobody can easily predict that. But locatability, I mean, a few people had mobile telephones in the hall this morning and they went, they went off, and we're all locatable nowadays by our mobile phones. Locatability of people through electronic communication networks is a very commonplace thing, and we don't really worry about that. George Orwell would have worried greatly that any state or commercial organisation should have had the power to pinpoint somebody in this room from hundreds of miles away, but actually we don't worry about it. And in, in the context of a culture where locatability is normal, it, it can be hard to make electronic monitoring, which is basically a penalty which relies on the capacity to monitor someone's location, it can sometimes be hard to present that as an onerous punishment when actually the phenomenon of locatability is so widespread and normal. Now this is another advert from one of the American companies. This is a probation officer who is fast asleep, sleeping very, very happily because all his work has been done by machinery and technology. And that's what the paragraph at the bottom of the page is about. Now, I think commercial organisations exaggerate that. And in fact, even if it's true what the commercial organisations can um, say about how wonderful technology is going to make the lives of probation officers, I think this probation officer is using so much technology that if he's not careful, he's going to be made redundant. The following, he's going to wake up and find that he hasn't got a job anymore. You know? But all these companies underplay the importance of probation. They tend not to see the value of the humanistic approaches which have traditionally been used to rehabilitate offenders. They, they sometimes try to talk as if they understand it and value it, but basically they think their technologies are better. And the political challenge for us in the 21st century is to embed electronic monitoring technology in rehabilitation and to reduce the use of prison, but not to let the technology go too far. And actually, I don't think we have so far let the technology go too far. So I'm not particularly worried about the dystopian possibilities. Paradoxically, I don't think we've used the technology as well as we might have done. We haven't used it in the best ways possible, but we certainly haven't used it in ways which are absurdly destructive of probation and social work. But there are dangers, right? Some people do fear the worst, right? And there may be worse. There are people who are dreaming these up, and you can find all the people who think of all the um, painful things you could do with electronic monitoring and all the 
the hyper control that you could um, get through remote surveillance, you can go on the web and you can find lots of people who want to do this. Will it happen? Are, are there no constraints on these things? Increasingly, I think there are lots of constraints on them. And I think that probation has managed to constrain the development of electronic monitoring rather well. But at the same time, given the crisis of prison numbers that we have in so many countries, we've really not made the best possible use of it to reduce the use of prison or to use it effectively in rehabilitation. What we can say is that, as I've been used to say, we, we have shaped it rather well. We, we've constrained its development by applying humanistic values. The technology is improving um, and it can't be disinvented. Um, the present forms are not over-controlling. The private sector does have very worrying ambitions, but even then, I, I don't think you can say that everything that happens in the private sector is all bad. You can have a constructive dialogue with some of the people in the commercial organisations. It does add, and this is the thing that probation and social work have to own up to, electronic monitoring adds in new ways of gaining compliance that social work by itself can't do. And it isn't incompatible with rehabilitation. In fact, in Spain, in Catalonia, you don't seem to have a problem with that. In England, if I, when I say this in England, lots of people do think electronic monitoring is incompatible with rehabilitation still. But in Spain and Catalonia, you don't seem to have the same problem. It has modestly reduced prison use and time spent in prison, and it has increased social integration for many offenders. But there's so much more that we can do in that context that we haven't yet done. And we have learned not to create ridiculously high expectations about what electronic monitoring can do. Politicians have learned not to follow the example of the commercial organisations who constantly exaggerate its transformative potential. But, but having said that, right, it's got a potential that we have not yet realised. And we should use all the forms of it in more and better ways. And lastly, down in Australia, some very interesting things are going on. <laughs> Wild animals are apparently being programmed to bite offenders on the leg if they stray from designated places. And the less serious offenders, they're only going to get koala bears. But the really serious offenders, they're going to get crossed.